if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSURF5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSURF5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. This one is for the savvy startups and SMBs out there. I've got a secret weapon for you that's going to skyrocket your sales without the unnecessary headaches that come along with using one of the big player CRM systems. That secret weapon is Close CRM. Now let's face it, we've all been there. We've used a clunky, confusing system that kind of makes you want to throw your laptop out the window. Well, fear not, Close is here to save your time, money, and sanity. Close has all of the powerful sales tools you need, minus the drama, to manage your leads, track your deals, and crush your targets effortlessly. It has calling, emailing, SMS, multi-channel sequences, and it even has meeting tracking built right in. It's easy to set up and implement. You can stop screwing around with CRMs that aren't built for you and start selling and managing customers today. You can start a free trial using the link in the show notes, special for SSP fans. Today's guest needs almost no introduction. Jen Allen is the chief evangelist at Challenger and the host of the Winning the Challenger Sale podcast. Now, this is Jen's second time coming on the SaaS Sales Players. She came on about a year ago to talk to us about the Challenger Sale methodology, how to apply it, what the main principles are, and some of the misconceptions about being a Challenger seller. In my very humble opinion, Jen is one of the most influential people in B2B sales right now and someone that you should absolutely be following on LinkedIn. And if you're not already subscribed to the Winning the Challenger Sale podcast, go check that out. Jen comes on the show today to talk to us about the current economic conditions that we're facing right now. Business buyers are being a little bit more cautious and waiting to see uh, what the future holds before they make big long-term decisions about their spend. So I thought it'd be great to have Jen come on the show and tell us how we can use some of the principles of Challenger Sale to be a better advocate of our customers, to be a better representative of our brands, and to ultimately have more success despite the current economic climate. So with that said, welcome Jen to the SaaS Sales Players. Well, we are live. Jen, thanks so much for coming back on to the show. Your episode was one of the highest volume episodes that I've done so far. And and I know it resonated with a lot of people last time you came on and talked about the Challenger sale, the Challenger customer. We had a really good dialogue about that. But yeah, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. I had such a blast with you last time. So when you reached out again, I was like, yes, 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 absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And if you haven't checked out Jen's podcast, go check that one out too. Hopefully you have. Um, and I'll link to that in the show notes. But where, where I think we want to focus today, we, we were just talking about this off air, Jen and I, is, mm-hmm. it, you know, we're recording this in October of 2022, and I've talked a lot about this on the show. If you're, if you haven't been living under a rock, you've probably been aware that we're in a little bit of a tough economy right now. And it's not, I mean, it's really tough all around, but it's especially tough, I think, in B2B and in tech and in a lot of other industries as well. And, and I know we, we get most of our folks that tune in are, are either in SaaS or trying to get into SaaS or tech sales. Uh, Jen, I know you work with folks from all kinds of industries who sell to B2B. So I think generally across the board, B2B seems to be really tough right now. And I think it's, you know, it's all cyclical, it's cyclical, but it's, uh, you know, it's kind of just the way things are. This is part of economics is there's going to be cycles like this where businesses tighten up the, the purse strings and it's a little bit harder to sell. So Jen being an expert in the challenger methodology, I thought what better person to have come in and talk to everybody about what we can do, how we can apply some of the principles of challenger to selling in a really tough market. So I know that was not really a question, but (laughs) 
hit us like give us give us the goods Jen uh after that yeah so first of all I love talking about this with you because you like me you're also a seller too so we live it it. we're not sitting on the sidelines saying like this is what we theorize it's like um the first thing I would say is it's a little bit like Groundhog Day right Challenger when we first did the research on what drives customer loyalty and what drives high performance in sales we did that research back in 08 and 09 the book the first book came out in 2012 Right, but we were talking about it with organizations for the the three years that preceded it. Um, and it's funny when you watch how the market performs, even people who are like, Yes, we are fighting this good fight in the recession, yeah, we are yeah. all in on Challenger. Man, the second the market gets good again, how quickly we default to what's easy versus what's right. Right. So it's like if you go back to 0809 when lots of companies were in survival mode. And lots of sales organizations had no choice but to say, we've got to evolve our playbook. We've got to evolve the conversation that we're having with our customers. Some of those very same companies fell back into the old patterns of, hey, it's just about more and volume and activity and just make it louder, hire more people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's ultimately why we are where we are today. Yeah, that that's been my experience is it's really easy to forget even after a month or a quarter of good times that you know, the, the challenger principles really are kind of timeless, but in very easy times, the, the default seems to be let's increase ad spend and let's add more people. And, oh, we just need to tweak messaging so that we sell more. And there's plenty of inbound lead flow. And all you're doing is guiding someone through a buying process versus being a challenger where you're having to, you know, again, constantly go and and challenge the thinking and dig a lot deeper into the business problems as, you know, as opposed to in good times where you might have someone come knock on your door inbound and buy from you without having to establish really too much of what the business challenges are, what the pain is. So that's absolutely the case. So yeah, let's get um, kind of down into the weeds here because this for me really more than anything is I- I'm trying to learn. I'm I'm staring down the barrel of uh, what, you know, could be a good quarter for me. I've got, you know, some, some pipeline, but my, you know, concern or the thing that kind of keeps me up at night right now is just how do I execute on it? How do I make sure that I'm not skipping steps or taking the easy way through some of these deals? And, and candidly, a lot of these deals are inbounds. Um, but just because they came inbound doesn't mean I should, you know, skip over being a true challenger in some of these deal cycles. And I can already sense just this quarter compared to, you know, even two or three quarters ago, the difference, uh, I've had, you know, a couple of really great deal cycles this year where it was, you know, sprint through and everything just fell perfectly, not, not perfectly. It's never perfect, but everything fell in place in terms of next steps. And I had prospects that were really interactive and engaging and followed up, uh, and, you know, were responsive when I followed up and those kind of things, but I can already sense, uh, I've got some stuff in the pipeline right now that is going to take a little bit more, uh, you know, digging and understanding and empathy. Frankly, uh, I'm going to need to deploy a little bit more empathy this quarter because I realize a lot of these brands are going through, you know, shuffle on their side. So let's start off. What you know, I guess what what kind of things are you seeing working with uh, your clients uh, today? Yeah. So first thing I want to say is just like you mentioned the word empathy. I think it's really important for anyone listening who carries a bag to be empathetic to yourself. Maybe that's sympathetic. It's probably the wrong word choice, but we are all going to lose deals that we thought were sure bets. I mean, there was a time in May when I lost a million dollars in a week of deals that were like Uh. already approved, already through red lines. Like we were doing the kickoff call, like it hurts. Right. But I think it is, does it make me or you or anybody listening a bad seller? No. In fact, these times are the best opportunities we have to move away from being order takers to true salespeople. So if you look at that through that lens and say like, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to beat myself up when I lose a deal, what I am going to do is reflect on it, learn from it and ensure, ensure I don't make that same mistake. That's first and foremost, I think the most important thing is just be kind to yourself. Now to get away from the fluffy stuff, I'll break it down into a few things that I think are really, really essential. Um, so one is in environments like these where buyers are literally running from places where they have to spend money, we have to look at the context and subject of the conversation we are having with customers. And here's exactly what I mean by that, right? If I show up and immediately talk about my solution and why my solution is better than what they're doing and why the ROI is 15 times or whatever the case may be. All I am saying to that customer is bye, 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 
right? Yeah. And right now people are trying to get away with as much as they humanly can do without having to take a purchase decision to their boss and go through legal and go through procurement. Like it's all work for them. It's extra work. Yeah. And so yeah. if I, as a seller, am constantly having a conversation about buying a solution, I'm going to alienate buyers. I might do a, a great first call, but they will ghost and they will slip away on the second call because in many cases, I haven't made the pain of what they're currently doing bigger than the pain of having to buy something. Mm -hmm. And that I think in and of itself is probably the single biggest message I try to convey to sellers right now, which is you can be better than the alternative. You can be better than their DIY approach. Better does not win in recessions. People settle for good enough, knowing, looking you in the eyes saying, you are better than what I'm doing. I'm still going to do this because it's safer. It's cheaper. It's the devil I know. So big, big lesson. Number one is we have to reflect on the conversation we're having. And what I mean by that is like, when we are speaking to buyers, we know from the research that we've continued to do, they want insight on their business. They don't want insight on your business. They want insight on their business. So how can you go in with a point of view, a hypothesis to say, maybe there's something here that you're underappreciating that's actually costing you so much money, time, whatever, that it's not allowing you to do this thing over here that you actually really do want to do. And how do you have that in kind of a same side of the desk conversation instead of like a preachy condescending tonality to it. So that's kind of big lesson. Number one, how I want to dig into something here. Cause yeah. this is, I've heard this from a lot of really high performers in, in the industry in the SaaS industry specifically. And that is this concept of a point of view. And it's not something I, I know that I, I must do it. Cause I think I've done enough deals where I've, I must've had enough of a point of view that people bought in and decided to, to choose me and, and my product over the competitor. But how would you suggest a rep who's got no idea how to, to formulate an opinion or a point of view on something? How do you get started in, in doing that in a deal? Perfect. Love yeah. this question. Okay, cool. So the first thing we have to do is recognize that it is a point of view. It is not a matter of fact. It is not a thesis statement, right? We sure. can off. And that is so important to put yourself in that headspace. But what I'm looking to do is I'm looking at, first, I'm looking at my solution. What is the problem that I solve for executives? And if that statement involves saves you time and money, better this, better that, go back to the drawing board. You don't understand okay. the reality of the problem. So we have to deeply understand the problem that our solution solves. Then I, as a seller, I'm going out and I'm looking at my top opportunities and I'm saying, what evidence can I find that would suggest that they have the problem that I solve and that it's costing them so much that they would be forced to do something about it. So I'll give you a very real example. I sell challenger sales training, right? Mm -hmm. I could look through my entire opportunity universe and say, everybody should buy challenger sales training because everybody should be better at sales. Yeah. The reality is that's never going to happen. Right. And that <laughs> right. was the naive outlook I had when territory planning is I'd be like, well, everybody could benefit from it. So how do I make them see why it's so great? Now, what I'm doing is I'm saying, you know, our solution solves for um, companies who lose a lot to no decision or lose a lot to price. So when I'm looking through my opportunity universe, I'm looking for those companies who are really struggling. And if they don't change that outcome, they are going to have a meaningful impact on the other side, right? So back in like COVID yeah. time, Zoom Zoom looks like a great company to call because they're really big. They have a ton of sellers, sexy name, right. but they had more demand than they had people to serve, right? So it's like, we've got to explore our logic to make sure that we're hunting the right opportunities when we're doing outbound. Now, when we're doing inbound, we also can get lazy. And I say we, because I'm just as guilty of this as anybody else. If we think somebody's interested, it's like, okay, I can skip that step. And then I can just you know get to what like they're exactly looking for. That's yeah. where I think a lot of sellers fall down is we, we can't skip that step. We have to go in with just as much curiosity, just as much a perspective. So how that might sound is, let's say I get a lead from ABC company. I'm looking at the problem I solve. I'm going out there. I'm Googling CEO, ABC company podcast, CEO, ABC company interview. Oh, um, if oh. I'm not, you know, a public company and they don't have any, any report. And then I'm looking and listening for things that would dictate how does that company believe they will grow? And then I'm looking for flaws and assumption there. 
So again, using my own example, I'm looking for companies that are like, hey, we're trying to drive massive 20% year over year growth by acquiring all these companies so that I can come back and say, you know what? Super smart, savvy strategy. However, what is on average the cost, like the time it takes for one of those sellers to learn how to sell that full bag? Many mm. companies buy the right acquisitions, but fail to arm the sellers to do it, right? So I'm looking for evidence of company is spending, doing things that will cost them more in the end. So that when I have that inbound call, I say, listen, John, like super excited to hear, you know, why you're interested in taking a look at Challenger today. Um, would it be okay with you if I just shared a, a quick hypothesis based on my own research of looking at your business? And regardless if we're right or wrong, so few sellers do that. So by yeah. virtue of doing it, you stand out. And by virtue of making an effort, what I will hear sometimes if I'm off is the, the customer will say like, I give you props, but here's what you missed, right? And then they'll go in and they'll teach me. And I'm immediately pulled into a two-way dialogue about their business problems and their business strategy. And that has never done me dirty in a deal, right? Versus just jumping into us and our solution. You just hit on you know, my irrational fear, which is I don't like to be wrong. Nobody likes to be wrong. Um, and it, but, but you're saying it's okay to be wrong because it actually, in some ways it might be better to be wrong because just having the, the perspective, having the point of view is enough to where you're going to engage that prospect in, Hey, at least this person came to the table with a perspective better than nothing. And now you can build on that foundation. Hey, here, Jesse, is where you were wrong in your you know, perspective about our business and our pain points and those kind of things. That is, okay, that was probably the most concise way I've ever heard that summarized. I've asked that question to a bunch of my colleagues who are who, who deploy that in their deal cycles, but I think that was really, wow, that, that really covered it in a way that I don't think I'd ever really understood it before is just having the perspective is going to get you, uh, you know, start starting the, con it's going to keep the thought conversation going in a way um, because you now have some place to start. And I think wow. this is really, really important because again, right now, if you're someone who's not selling with a perspective, then the conversation's really over in October of 2022 because to your earlier point, which is if there's just not enough pain uh, or, you know, there's not a significant problem to be solved here, then it's not going to be worth the hassle of going to my manager as, you know, from the buyer's perspective, it's not going to be worth the hassle to go to my manager and ask for budget, ask for approvals, all that stuff. If there's just not this massive amount of pain, and in this case, a perspective, uh, you know, that can turn into a two-way conversation that's a lot more meaningful and productive than just, here's why our price is better. Here's why, you know, yes. we're flashier. We have better features this, or, you know, he, we have these similar customers that, right. So that's very, very good. Everyone should, should rewind and listen to that again on the show. <laughs> if you're listening to this, rewind and listen to that perspective piece again. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm serious when I say, I think this is what sets the top, you know, whatever percent of sellers apart from, from, you know, the rest is having that level of business conversation and bringing something like that to the table adds serious value as opposed to just, again, you know, pitching feature function or price or whatever other thing that you're going to lean on. I think that having that perspective is huge. And let me give it. So I, I yeah, like yeah. you was always worried about being wrong. Right. So I would either overstudy it, like over prepare and come with just like an, a ridiculous amount of information and be like, look at me. Do I get extra credit? Because I like studied your business and it would come off <laughs> inauthentically. Right. So now how I phrase it is like, I'll say things like, you know, John, I don't work within your four, four walls. Right. I'm really curious to compare what I've discovered in my own research against your observations. Here's what I, what I think I can make sense of, but help me understand what have I missed? That question is one of the most powerful mm. things that we can say, because again, humans love to correct. They love to say, well, here's what you don't realize. Right. And immediately to your point, just a minute ago, we are now getting into a conversation about our, their business. And when we get into conversations about their business, it allows us to be much more powerful allies to our customers. And I know this stuff sounds so obvious. And I'm not like some mega buyer, but I will say the vast majority of sales conversations that I am brought in on, it is still a dog and pony show. It is still mm -hmm. look at what we do, how much better it would be if you had this without any sort of context, which means we are then leaving it in the hands of the buyer to connect those dots, to do all the work versus us being able to come in and say, you know, John, you talked about how important it is that your sellers sell the full bag of acquisitions that you bought. 
what's the cost of them not getting this right in the next six months? What if it takes them a year to start selling it? What is the implication on your business? And then you start priming that like executive level conversation versus what is a very junior conversation, which is like, here's my thing. And here's why I think you should buy it. Mm. What was the question again? Repeat the the question that you asked that stimulates that, that, Mm -hmm. you know, conversation. It is any form of like, you know, here's what I've been able to find on my own, but help me understand. I don't work within the four walls of your company. What have I missed or what have I got wrong here? And that's inviting them to then share their own observations or their own inside baseball because they work there. We don't. I like that. I like that you even say inside the four walls, it just sort of, you know, creates a, a picture and and gets the creative juices flowing on their side. So great question to to ask to kind of, yeah, extract a little bit more information. What, uh, yeah, what else? I guess, uh, you know, anything yeah. else that you're seeing that works really well besides having a, pers- we've talked about having a perspective, bringing a point of view to the table to one, set yourself out, uh, set, set yourself apart from other reps that might be also selling to this prospect, but, you know, also being able to build a better case for value in a time like now when it's harder to get budget approvals, but what's next? What else uh, are you seeing work well? Yeah. The second big one is just consensus decision-making. When the economy gets uncertain, we won't use the R word, but when the economy gets uncertain, what does everybody do? We tighten up on risk aversion, right? I don't want to be the one person banging my fist on the table for this, this solution. So even if I am the quote unquote decision maker, right, I'm still going to be like, Bob, Sue, Mary, go check this thing out and make sure it's legit. The problem is when the 08, 09 recession happened, we were coming off of an era where there was a single decision maker in many cases. And then we moved from like, you know, three to four to five. Now, when we've studied it, the last time we studied it was in 2020, the average was 11.2. I would, I would have to estimate that that number is even bigger now. So you got 11.2 people on the customer side, having some sort of say in the buying decision. And here's where this breaks down. When we had two or three or four or five, you could still feasibly go door to door and be like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Mm -hmm. Now, by the time you get through 12 people, that's a quarter, right? Like we've lost a quarter and number one left, number two moved into a different position. And so we can't afford to go door by door um, with our consensus building. And rather what we have to do is instead of trying to get 12 people together, 10 people, however many it is, and let, make them listen to our solution, we have to take a step back and sell the problem first. Mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is if I get a group of people from the buying group together, it is so tempting to be like, let me just show them our solution and hope, hopefully they're wowed. That's skipping a step. First, we have to actually facilitate a discussion on the problem such that we can surface disagreement because the yeah, odds yeah. of 12 people agreeing on anything are almost none, right? So we get, you know, we start with one stakeholder, maybe we get a second stakeholder, and then we use their opinion to to dictate the rest of the buying process. When in reality, there's probably three, four people in that buying group who don't agree with those other two people. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in these group meetings, the first thing we have to do is put the lay of the land out and say, all right, here's how we've interpreted and heard the problem thus far. Disagree with this thing pick it apart. Is this even the right priority that we should be focused on? What happens if we punt this out six months? Is anything like, is the earth going to fall? Like we, we have to go in, not trying to sell, but really trying to surface that disagreement. Otherwise that's happening behind the scenes when we're not there to have a voice in it. So the way that we manage and run group meetings, I think is really, really essential. It's a big meaty topic. Yeah. What, so what do you call this, this pillar of, of sort of the sales approach? Is this selling to a premise or is it, you know, is it more about selling to the group? Yeah, it's definitely about getting the group aligned on the problem to be solved and the the relative importance of that problem. Because like, if you called our business now, I could give you 14 problems we need to solve, right? Mm -hmm. And an eager seller will be like, I'm one of them. I'm one of the 14. Like, let me get in and try to sell her. Right. that's number 13 or 14 on the list. Like maybe it's a nice to have. And that's, that's the thing I think I see a lot right now is sellers getting excited because our pipelines are dry. We get excited when there's interest, but interest and intention are two very, very different things. Mm -hmm. And we can burn so much of our time on interested prospects and doing air quotes on a podcast, interested (laughs) prospects that actually don't have organizational buy-in on the importance of that problem. 
and me, you know, may, again, maybe there is, maybe it is a pain, but if their colleagues don't agree that that's the biggest priority, it, it, that, that seems like probably the most common scenario is what might be a number one on the pain scale for you and I, someone on our team might think is a number 14 or way at the bottom of that list. Right. So getting everybody aligned on where things fall in the priority queue, what can a rep do to start to challenge a prospect to then, you know, be able to uncover where they sit in, in, in the, you know, in the priority queue or in the timeline queue, uh, you know, or in the time frame. Uh, yeah. What are some, maybe is there some questions you know of or some scripting that you use uh, or other, you know, tactics that you use to, to get that information? Yeah. So one thing I would say is we have to be authentic. I know that is the cheesiest, corniest line, but we really have to do, we have to do that. And and specifically what I mean is when you have someone that is truly interested in your product, have the conversation about the good, bad, and ugly of buying it. Right. So in, it, I'll give you an example. When I was a buyer, I yeah. was at an event and I saw Arthur at Chili Piper, um, presenting about the problem that Chili Piper solved. And it completely activated me. I was like, I am your prospect. I need this. I want this. And it was crystal clear to me in my head that this yeah. solved a huge problem for our business, right? So then I speak with Arthur and Arthur did a wonderful thing in the first call. He said, Jen, I can tell you are so excited about this. And I can tell you think this would be so good for your business. But here's all the things that people typically will, will block this for or say, let's punt this six months out. So let's talk through who is most likely to, to think like that or say that. And let's get a game plan so you can prevent that objection instead of having to respond to it. And because of that, I was able to go to our marketing partners and say, look, I know that we prefer the way that we route leads today, but here's the cost mm -hmm. of us doing that, right? And I was able to have that conversation to win them on the problem because there was like 40 things marketing would have bought before this. But once I was able to speak in their language and help them understand, look how much manual time you are wasting. And because you're wasting all this time over here, you actually can't do these things over here that you really want to do. And it allowed me to speak in their language. So I think one of the best jobs we can do as buyers is help our individual stakeholders understand the other buying group members. What are they most likely to object to? Why might they want to punt this out? What might be more important? And almost play, you know, devil's advocate with them to make sure before they go marching down the hallway that they've really considered those alternative points of view and have a talk track that's likely to resonate. Um, so that's a really, yeah. really, really big one for me. So he, so Arthur, huge shout, shout out to Arthur because that's that's pretty bold. And you said that was in the first meeting that you had with him. Yeah, because I mean, I was sold. I was like, this is a yeah. problem. We need Easy. to buy it. And he's like, slow down, girl. Like, and that's. I think that's a part of what great sellers do. They don't get as, as like lost in the excitement as the buyer does. They're the ones to pump the brakes and be like, let's just do this the right way instead of the fast way. So my, my manager calls that happy years. And yeah. I'm really, really guilty sometimes of happy years where if a first call goes really well, someone's really excited. It's easy to then go in and forecast it uh, according to how the tone of that meeting was versus against digging down a little bit further that's a really, so he, the way he postured the question was really good because it doesn't come across as like, Hey, you're super excited. First of all, I think it doesn't come across as who else, you know, Jen above you needs to sign off on this. That's yes. like I think how most people are like, okay, how do I, how do I access the power, right? Or the authority, the, the decision maker. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying, well, Jen's not the signer. So we got to go to Jen's boss or her boss's boss or whoever. Right. So I think the way that he like postured that was a lot more respectful and polite and it wasn't, you know, Hey Jen, I'm glad you're excited, but we already know we're going to need to go to your vice president uh, or whoever. So I like the way that that was structured. And I think it's really cool that he got it out of the way in the first meeting. You know, he didn't waste any time in, you know, then doing a whole demo or follow-up step or eval or POC or anything like that. He went right to, you know, before we proceed, I need to understand some things, right? And it's mm -hmm. okay to ask for those things. I think a lot of times we just miss that in, in a lot of sales training. You just never hear that. You never hear it's okay to slow down a little bit on, you know, the first couple of calls to make sure you have your facts together and make, to make sure you understand where you're falling in that priority line. Otherwise you're going to get to a point where you have it forecasted to close and it doesn't actually happen. The The prospect goes away, they go quiet, the project gets canceled, whatever it is. So I think that's a really cool way to posture that. And uh, I'm definitely going to be stealing that, that, you know, the phrasing anyway, 
Yeah. And I think it's like, at the end of the day, if you just put your, your stakeholders best interests at heart and you let that be your compass, the last thing you want is your stakeholder to like run into the next room and be like, we need to buy this and have them look like a fool. Right. So I love the way that you, you contrasted what we just talked about from the, like, who else needs to hear this in order to make a decision, because then it immediately just, it sets a weird tone. And and we, like, I would say in environments like this, it's not always the decision maker who makes the call, right? Like when you watch consensus, what happens is, especially with like risk aversion around political capital, leaders, some leaders, not all, really want to do right by their people. And they'll say like, hey, if I've got people on the ground that are fighting for a tool, we normally have to like drag them tooth and nail to get them to use stuff. Like I'm open to that. So I would say don't disqualify someone by their title. I have had deals close on the back of people that were nowhere near our ICP, but had a ton of passion for the problem that we solved. That's awesome. Cool. And so what else, anything else that you're seeing that's helping sellers in these times move things along and build a better business case for their deals? Yeah. The, so every month we pick a theme for this winning the challenger sale podcast, right? And last month's theme was around mutual action plans or mutual close plans. There's like 55 different needs for them. I'm going to be completely yeah. honest with you. Like I didn't hear the term mutual action plan until like six months ago. I am not, I've been selling for 18 years. I've never used them. <laughs> and then I lost a couple deals this year that I think had I used them, I probably wouldn't have lost or I would have lost sooner. And so one of the areas I'm super curious about and like when I've interviewed a bunch of my guests was just understanding how, when, why, where they use mutual action plans. And essentially one of the big takeaways that I got from it is people say yes to things often without recognizing what that yes means. So someone might Mm. say, yes, I want to buy. So let's make it happen. And they think it's a quick review of legal and it's maybe it hits procurement's desk. What they don't realize is like there's data privacy laws that need to be reviewed and they need to fill out all this paperwork. And so where I I think, you know, I've I've done a disservice to myself in the past is not laying all of that out, forecasting the deal because I've got someone who really wants to buy, but then losing them because they're like, I don't, I didn't know I was signing up for all of this. So being crystal clear up front with here are the things that are required in order to be able to buy. Here's my advice, my coaching for each of those steps to help you through it. Okay. So this is going to be a really interesting topic uh, because I'm a big fan of mutual action plans, mutual milestones, whatever. I've heard them called a whole bunch of different things and I've implemented them. Uh, I've implemented them both both successfully and unsuccessfully. And I'm really curious to get your thoughts on, you know, the unsuccessful ones, but so it sounds like you had a, you know, you hadn't heard about it until about six months ago. And then now you're, you're pretty bought into the model of, of using a mutual action plan. And let me actually take a step back just for the listeners who maybe have no idea what we're talking about. Yes. Um, the, the way that I understand it, and this might vary company to company, manager to manager, prospect to prospect, right? But generally speaking, where I've seen it done, what I've seen done is it's basically a document. And I've seen this be either a spreadsheet, a Google, you know, drive or a Google doc, uh, a, a Google slide deck or a PowerPoint, whatever, you know, format. And you're basically, you know, working through project milestones side by side with your point of contact at a company or multiple points of contact uh, at your pro- uh, your prospect company. And usually these are everything from like step one is get an NDA in place before we can proceed further. And step two might be select us as the vendor or, you know, step three might be do a proof of concept. And then step four is review legal documents. Step five is, you know, establish a master service agreement or something like that all the way until I've seen it done all the way till launch, which I think in in SaaS specifically works really well because you're showing, you know, hey, from from where we stand today, here are the steps that need to happen before this is live and your, you know, employees or your, you know, whoever is using the software in a live environment. And here's what steps have to be taken. And in most enterprise SaaS, there's like a four to six or eight week time frame for implementation. So you want to bake that in. And they're actually, in my opinion, very handy if you want to essentially commit a deal uh, with your prospect is, is, is you can say, look, if you want to go live by January 2nd, here's everything that needs to be done. We have to factor in your implementation timeframes. 
And, you know, we need to understand how long your evaluation time is expected to be. Is it, do you need a month to evaluate our product? Do you need seven months? <laughs> you know, if you really have no idea, this can be a really great framework to basically plot out your deal. And then what I like about them is, and I had a manager who would, he would ask, he would say, do you have a Google, do you guys use Google or, or Microsoft for your email and for your, you know, document management? And if they were using Google, he would share it lot like on a live drive so that it was interactive and there's probably some other tool out there uh you could use to to do like a collaborative document uh, i know microsoft can kind of do some of that and i think one note i'm new to microsoft but um you know google drive microsoft both have their version of like live collaborative so you can actually then see when someone goes in and makes an update to it and if, if you don't see an update in three or four days or seven days you can go in and remind the prospect that you're working on this together so i think from a you know framing or a posturing standpoint, it's really cool because you can go and talk to your prospect and say, this is a mutual action plan. I, like I, at this point, you don't, you don't obviously say it just like this, but you're kind of implying that at this point, I'm no longer the seller. I'm more like a consultant and I'm a project manager and it's my job to follow up on stuff that doesn't get done just like any project manager would. So let's make realistic, you know, timeframes and milestones to get this completely accomplished. Right. And, and here's the, you know, the end goal is go live or whatever. So I do like that. I have seen them work. Here's where I've seen them fall off. And I'm really curious to get your, you know, your experience and what you would do if this happened. Sometimes adoption is really hard. And where I've seen this struggle, you know, where I've seen prospects struggle is let's say they're evaluating four or five different vendors. And while it's nice of you to put together a mutual milestone or mutual action plan for them, sometimes they're like, oh, that's another thing I have to open up and look at. And it's like homework. It feels like homework. And, you know, you, you hearken back to when you're a kid and you just, you know, you had weekend work or something like that. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I just don't want to open this. Like, I'm too tired. I've already, you know, heard five vendor pitches today. And, and now this guy is asking me to, to go in and, and, you know, fill out stuff after hours. Right. How would you suggest, and we hear this a lot here where I'm at that reps will say, I don't know, mutual action plans, they don't work because they don't get adopted. Have you seen that? And would you have any recommendations for someone who's struggling to get their mutual action plans uh, adopted by the prospect? Yeah. So I'm going to give credit to Aaron Evans. He was a guest on the show last month. He's from Flow State. Phenomenal guy, super smart thinker in beauty sales, modern sales. And yeah. he, his his take was in many, not all, but many of those situations, it's because the plan it's not is not actually mutual. It's a to-do list for the customer of like, go back and do all of these things, which yes. point is like, I don't want homework. I'm a grown adult. Like I, I finished school, so I have to do homework. So I think right. the key word there is mutual. Um, so making sure that there's an even balance of what we are taking on versus just telling the customer you're responsible for all of these things, always seeking to help, to aid, to serve, right? That's one. Um, the second thing is I think when you are in a competitive situation, like you described, Stepping away from here's what you have to do to buy our thing and thinking from the context of here's what you have to do to buy, right? So you make it as subjective as possible, not subjective, make it as objective, objective. as possible. <laughs> Almost gave you the, the exact wrong advice there. Make yeah. it as objective as possible, because I will tell you, like we see this a lot in our business, companies will go out and be like, I want to implement a sales methodology. And you're like, well, that's so cute of you. Of course you do. <laughs> and then yeah. when you actually like, you look at the conversations they're having, they're all about, here's why our methodology is the best, right? So they have a bunch of those, but they're nervous, right? Because maybe this is the first big investment they're making in a sales methodology. And they're constantly going out there and researching and talking to people being like, do we have it right? Are we doing the right thing? So I think where it can be very, very powerful in a competitive situation is you strip yourself away from it and say, I'm very interested in helping you make the right decision on a sales methodology, whatever the solution is, even yeah, if yeah. it means it's not us. So what I've prepared is a roadmap of all of the steps that we should be considering across the way to help you arrive at the right answer in the, in the time frame that you have where you are you know, responsible for launching it by, let's say, January 1st. So would you be open if we just looked at that and I'm going to might wrap map out the jobs to be done on your part, how I'm going to aid you in those from our perspective, and then some other places I think you should go to and, and kind of read. So I would even put in there things like, you know, if there was an article on how to select a sales methodology, I would put that in there for them because what I'm trying to do is take work off their plate 
help them make the right decision, whether the right decision is us or not, you do get paid for helping buyers buy. Um, and I think sometimes we're so focused on helping buyers buy our thing. We miss yeah, an opportunity yeah. to step back and say, let me just help you with the jobs to be done. Cause it's your first time buying this and you're freaked out and it's understandably so. So if we go in with that mindset, I think it also changes the language and the tone of what's in the mutual action plan. And I'll, I'll add to that a couple that uh, of things that I've done that have, that have helped move them along and, and increase adoption. So one is getting very as, as personal as you can with your prospect about what their personal motivations are for the whole project at large, right? So, you know, we're implementing challenger sales training, SaaS software. What's in it for you, Mrs. or Mr. Prospect? Why, why do you care about this project? Is it career advancement? Is it a bonus at the end of the year? Is it your boss? You need to redeem yourself because you messed up something last year and <laughs> you know hired the wrong sales training firm or implemented the wrong SaaS last year. And now you need to, you know, this is redemption. So figure out what's in it for them on a personal level. And I wouldn't obviously put that into a document because in a lot of cases, these mutual uh, action plans are public or they get shared internally and externally. So you don't, you don't want to document that, but um, I think for personal context, then when you, you know, when you need to text your prospect or give them a call, you can say, or, you know, and I've, I've actually done this before, I'll, you know, Hey prospect, we're this close. And I know that annual bonus is, is, is in line for you. Or, you know, maybe that's a cheesy way to say it, but like, it's okay to be human. And, and back to what you said earlier, it's okay to be authentic. And I think you can authentically say to someone, Hey, I know that, that your bonus is on the line, or I know that, you know, this is going to help you get to your, you know, uh, yeah, your, 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 your comp bonus this year, it's going to help you get to that next level in your career. And that's why I care so much about this to, to even put this on paper and, and make this a mutual project for the two of us. Right. There's something in it for both of us. So let's drive towards that goal. So I think getting personal with these and really trying to figure out at some point in your cycle, what's in it for the the primary champion. Um, Cause there will, there will like be one person that's really going to work on this document. Um, but my next piece of advice would be to get more than one person on it as well. So once you've got that one primary champion on it, figure out what's in it for that person, but also get several people working on it because that's when you start to, that's when you can, I don't want to say predict it hundred percent, but you can get pretty, pretty good at forecasting your deals when you see that six or seven other people are in updating a document that you created in a, you know, in a Google drive or on a word doc that has a bunch of steps, like get an NDA in place, do a demo, do a POC. When you see people marking it done, that's when, you know, and when you see several people doing that, I feel like that's when you have a pretty good indicator that there's some firepower behind the deal. And that's when you then just have to play the role of like risk mitigation. You know, as long as people are moving towards this and everyone seems to be excited about it and everyone's staying on top of this, all we need to do now is just make sure nothing shuts this down, whether that's the legal or the procurement team or the cybersecurity team or some other, you know, member of the leadership team who feels like this should be delayed six months. All we're doing now is just, you know, managing the risks of the deal. And, you know, again, the, the nice thing about these is they document the specific dates. I, when I put them together, I'll put, you know, January 2nd, go live. We need six weeks leading up to that for launch, two weeks of Q and a testing UAT testing, uh, user acceptance testing for anyone who doesn't know the acronym. And then, you know, we plan for four weeks of evaluation and the signature needs to happen by this date in order for us to launch on January 2nd. And it's a really, really good way to get people to commit. And again, you can get a lot of people to commit to it if you get tons of people working on it. So those would be my two pieces of advice is figure out what's in it for the prospect, the champion specifically. You do want one you know, main champion or owner, I think, to, to make sure it all gets done. But the more people you have working on it, the more I, I think you're likely to close the deal at that point. So that's cool to hear you guys are, are coaching to that and and talking about it as a theme for, for last month. Uh, because I don't, I'm not aware of like, a lot of other sales. I've, I've, I had never heard about it from a sales training or anything like that. I only learned about them because I had a manager who'd been doing this for 30 years say, let me show you my milestones that I use and he called them <laughs> milestones. I had never heard the word mutual action plan. He called them milestones. And it was, he was the same one that said, and if they have Google drive, just ask him if you can share it as a live collaborative doc, that way you can check in on it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious also for listeners, you know, reach out to Generi if you have even better ideas, like, again, there's probably a, a SaaS tool out there. And if there's not one, someone should create this, uh, that does, you know, 
collaboration or real-time collaboration on a checklist. Yeah. I'm sure like a sauna or something like that could be used. Maybe the, the tech adoption might cause some challenges, but, and that's why I think the Google docs works really well or, or a spreadsheet. But uh, I also have a template that I use that I'm happy to share with anyone who reaches out. It's uh, just kind of a, a guide. Every company is different. Every sales cycle is a little bit different, but this has generally what steps an enterprise would need to check in order to buy a piece of software, or procure a piece of software. So reach out if you're interested in that template. Yeah. And I think the only other thing I'd add, so first of all, I yeah. love your suggestions that make it personal one in particular, because then, you know, you feel comfortable pushing, right? I think that's yes. where some of us get icky is like, oh, am I pushing more? Who cares more, me or the prospect? And you know, you've got confidence to be able to push on it. So I love that one. The other great benefit to doing this is if you have committed to certain dates and the prospect starts ghosting and missing them, it is such an easy out for yes. you to say like, you know, can you help me understand, did this get backburnered, right? Like we had a mutual agreement here. So it sounds, feels like something has changed. You can call out the elephant in the room because you have been clear on next steps and expectations and timing. So again, I'm always very cautious about my time and seller, other sellers' time. Like we have to protect that. And so if someone is not following up on their end of the mutual plan, have the icky conversation because you may save yourself yeah, a bunch yeah. of time you can spend somewhere else. And it's so much less icky when it's, as you said, all documented, all laid out with dates yeah. and timeframes and steps. And look, in these, I've seen new steps get added, steps get taken away, uh, you know, steps, timeframes get missed. Like you said, the, the deadlines get missed and it just gives you an opportunity to say, hey, we put this all together. Uh, you know, again, we need this all done by this time. So this can happen. And I always think of the analogy from the selling above and below the line. I don't know if you've read that one, but the trains leaving, because this is how execs think about making business decisions is, you know, if this train doesn't get out, out the door on time, then it's going to hold up another train somewhere else in the country and it could cause this whole domino effect. And so again, you can really get very precise on your dates with your deal cycles when you're like, Hey, look, this has to get done. You know, we've got to get the NDA in place by this time. We've got to get the POC completed by this time. So you have enough time to evaluate it and get this reviewed by this team and this, you know, decision maker to get it signed, to get it launched and tested all by this time. Right. So it, it can make your forecasting very precise. Um, very and much so. Again, the only downside I've ever seen with mutual action plans is just getting them adopted, not making them feel like homework and really getting the ownership from, from your champion. Agreed. Agreed. And like nothing better right now than knowing if someone doesn't have a go live date for whatever you're selling, man, is that a red flag for an interested prospect, not an actual buyer. So it's just even by virtue of having the conversation, it could expose like, maybe I've walked myself into a wrong situation. Maybe I need to back up. So I, I'm a big proponent of anything that helps us recognize that. Yeah. So what's the theme on the show for October? You said mutual action plans was a theme last month. So I just what's screwed on? it up. Mutual action plan is actually this month. Last oh, month okay. was closing was, was driving urgency for close. And then next month is negotiation. So we try to tailor it, the topics around the time of year um, when the topics come in handy. So all about late stage stuff now. That's perfect. I love that you guys do urgency in September because here we are, we're the last quarter of the year holidays, uh, economy right now, specifically to this year. What what are some of the, just really quickly, I, I'd love to hear some of the urgency tips that you had from last month that might help sellers. It's not quite too late. I don't think in, you know, especially if you're selling something more on the mid market or commercial side, or even, you know, lower enterprise, non-retail. I think if you're selling enterprise to retail, the door is probably getting ready to close. <laughs> if not, it's likely already closed. Those code freezes have already started for the year. But yeah, maybe you can pass on some of the tips from from driving urgency and then, uh, you know, everybody should tune in next month for negotiation because that also sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, so a couple of big ones are one, urgency is not a late stage play. Urgency actually starts way back in the beginning. If you are looking yeah, at yeah. building urgency, once you've got the yes, you've missed the boat, right? Which I love. Um, and then the second one is how we build urgency. And this is going to sound somewhat obvious, but even I catch myself falling into bad behavior from time to time. The urgency should be on the buyer's terms, not on our terms. Meaning like, it's not urgent that I need this deal to cross my Q4 goal. That's not urgent to the prospect. And I think we all get into those cutesy moments where we're like, I'm one goal away. Can you just 
sign this by whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah. it gives a bad name to perfect. We get away with it sometimes, but it's just, it's not a good look, right? Rarely. <laughs> Rarely, it's exactly. My first sales manager in my career, like drilled that into my, he was like, selling is never about you. Selling is never about the rep. Yeah. And I've carried that with me for well over a decade at this point. And I can never go back, but I have heard it work for people. Occasionally, sometimes you get a relationship with a prospect where you can say, oh, come on, I'm this, this far away from my quota this quarter. But again, I think it, you're right that it's more sustainable, scalable, and repeatable if you always, you know, default to what the prospect's timeline and urgency is. Yeah. And so for that, you're looking at not um, urgency to do something, but the cost of doing nothing right? Because we as humans respond far more urgently to the avoidance of risk than we do to, to the realization of a benefit. So if, to be very specific language, like, you know, if you start next month, that will allow you to do this, this, and this is like, okay, but if I start the following month, I can do that then too. But if you frame it as like every three weeks that go by without you having this, it's costing you X amount of time, X amount of money to, to solve the problem in the way that you're solving it. Suddenly that's creating urgency around like, shoot, I'm the problem. I'm, I'm sitting around complaining. I have no time because I'm taking all this extra time to do this job that could be far more accelerated. If I had this solution, we just, we have short memories. These executives are yeah, bouncing yeah. from meeting to meeting. Like we have to be really, really diligent about reminding them of that. Even if we did it early cycle, it, it, we've got to keep hammering that late cycle as well. Awesome. Yeah, anything else for urgency that that needs to happen to help reps drive that urgency? The other big thing is, um, so one of the authors of the Challenger Sale, Matt Dixon, just came out with a new book. I don't know if you saw it called The Jolt Effect. No. Um, oh, you got to check it out. It's really okay. good. So basically what they did is they looked at just this topic of losses to no decision and status quo, and they realized there's two components. So we talked a lot about FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Right. What they found was FOMU, which is fear of messing up, is even more of a driver of no decision. So it's not you get to pick which one you play with. You have to do both. You have to first teach them the cost of inaction. But there's a huge fear of even if I do something, will I screw things up? And so Jolt is basically breaking down what do sellers need to be mindful of late stage so that they can mitigate the executive's fear of failure. Um, so there's all sorts of really cool tactics. We had him on the webinar to, to break down Jolt and um, wow, really good stuff. FOMO, that's awesome. You guys coined FOMU. <laughs> he did. He coined FOMU. I was he like, I'm it. so yeah. jealous. I love yeah. that. I love that. That's it. perfect. And it's yeah. so true. Uh, fear of messing up, I do think probably is a greater driver than fear of missing out. Uh, so the book's called Jolt. I'm going to have to check that one out. Yeah, definitely do. That's a good one. Awesome. Well, uh, anything else? So so we're coming up here at time. Yeah. Uh What's what's coming up on on your calendar that my my listeners can check out in terms of webinars or podcast episodes? It sounds like we're in the middle of mutual action plan month, and we've got negotiation month coming up. Anything else uh, you'd like to to plug? Yeah, no, I would probably just plug that stuff. Um, every second Thursday of the month, I do a webinar in the Winning the Challenger Sales Series, and that's where we're breaking down the how. So that's where you can get like, here's a framework for a mutual action plan. Like, here's tips and tricks, and really getting to tactical level. And then the podcast comes out every uh, Tuesday. It's on the same topic, but this is where we're bringing in other voices. So what I love about that approach is I've always been someone who struggles when I'm trying to learn from a seller that just like personality wise doesn't match me. And so every month I pick four very different voices on the same topic with the hopes that you know, if you're a little bit more outgoing, you can learn from this person. If you're more of like a nerdy geek like me, you can learn from this person, like, <laughs> and just give you variety in the perspective. Um, so we will continue to do those every week, every month, um, throughout the year. So check us out. I love that. And I, that's such a contrast from where I think the industry came from, which is there's only one type of person in sales, right? It's always the extrovert. <laughs> and it's so not true because some of my top performing colleagues are, are complete introvert nerds. Uh, and would totally own that too, by the way. So uh, that's really cool that you tailor that to the many, many personalities. And of course, the whole book Challenger Sale is about those different personalities and how to use those to to your best abilities to to get deals done and and help customers. So 
Jen, thanks so much for coming on the show. How can my listeners get in touch with you if they want to reach out? Make it real easy. I'm a one trick yeah. pony. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> so find me, Jen Allen on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to learn more about Challenger, if you want to talk sales, any of that good stuff. But Jesse, thank you so much. I always so enjoy my conversations with you. Yep. We will definitely do this again. Thanks again, Jen, for coming on. 